The birds who live at Birdsacre foster a greater appreciation and sensitivity to nature, inspired by Cordelia Stanwood, who used to live at Birdsacre from 1865 until 1955, studying birds. The birds inspire us to be better stewards and to take care of our world for them and for us, because we all need good habitat and healthy food. When people visit Birdsacre, they often accidentally refer to the enclosures that the birds live in, that there is their home, as cages. And that's not how the birds feel about it when they're inside. So today we're going to have a look inside their enclosures to see how they view us and how we're trying to improve their enclosures by remodeling and making things more comfortable. This is the Broadwing house Mr. with Mr. Kufu in it. He has an injury from a car accident where the wing hangs down, but it doesn't limit him so much that he can't fly from his private perch over to perch two but he would not be able to survive out in the wild. So by perching very low and preying on things, especially that go along the road, he is easily uh, susceptible to getting hit by cars. Now the Broadway likes a habitat just like this, a nice tall story of leaf canopy. You might think that he gets bored in here, but after he eats, what does a bird do? He watches. He has a perch and prey mentality, so he'll often sit rather low in the forest canopy and wait for something to go by, particularly mammals, but sometimes he'll go after amphibians too, which is one reason why the Broadwings weren't as affected by DDT as, say, the eagles. Uh, they still were affected, but they also had a more variety diet. He's king in his own castle, and this is a beautiful panoramic view for him to be able to watch things. My favorite times are early in the morning and late afternoon where the shadows and the breeze comes through. It's very beautiful at Bird's Acre, and it's quiet without anyone around. But he also feels very safe in here. Our goal here is to make the birds feel as comfortable as possible, but also get them to be ambassadors, revealing the marvelous nature of their species. So this is Lady Redtail Hawk. She came to us from Michigan oh, about 2016 with a soft tissue injury to her wing. The rehabilitator tried to fly her with a falcon to see if she could keep up outside, but she was just not strong enough to be able to be released. But she's very happy here, and we've just rearranged her enclosure to make things more simple for her to make decisions to feel more comfortable. That's the one she prefers in the wintertime because it's opposite the door. She has a nice hutch to go into to stay warm or feel sheltered and safe. That's perch one, and that's one of her favorite ones where she likes to sleep. And then in the morning, she likes to fly over to the perch in front of the, uh, the enclosure and sun herself. She'll spread out her wings, fan out her tail. Uh, red tails are, are about 16 different species across the country, and they're a marvelous bird. They require having tall perches where they can, or tall trees to nest on and be able to have a commanding view of the surrounding environment. But given a choice between prey availability and a nice nest site, having a nice nest site is really crucial habitat for them to exist. You would think the food is more important than having a crucial nest site. And both male and female will put their nest together. Uh, they may make a couple of different ones and if one gets disturbed or they don't feel safe, they will leave that nest site. But when they claim it, they'll put a little green sprig of uh, spruce or pine, and the female will start to cup the bowl of the nest. Typically, you're not, red tails are solitary, so usually they're by themselves or they might be with their mate. Very rarely do you have a situation where there are two females together because they're both uh, dominant of the nest. Only in rare instances have they ever had this happen. We've been very lucky to have been able to have two female red tails in the same enclosure and like each other. Uh, the older red tail years ago laid a eggs in the corner, and the female, the second one, went over and they took turns incubating. In the wild, in such a situation, then the male just provides the food and the two females 
take turns incubating and keeping the nests safe. So this is the barred owl Napoleon. Uh, a young owl who came to us with an injured wing. He can still fly pretty good, but the wing hangs down so far that he'd be limited outside. We tried to have a surgical operation, but the, the bone is so badly damaged that to try to fuse it, it might have exploded. So it's better to just let the wing heal. Napoleon is very, while being young, very curious. So he's always checking things out. He has a, a delightful curiosity and loves coming out here. In the winter we had this wrapped up with plastic to keep him a little warmer against the cold winds and it was beautiful on a full moonlit night. He was even happier when we took down the plastic and the glass patio doors that gave him a view onto the world. And now he gets to watch the geese down below and the squirrels running by. And he becomes very interested. A squirrel came a little close yesterday and he leaned forward on his perch tilted down almost horizontal, and then no sound as he descends down. The squirrel got away, much of his chagrin. So a barred owl has to be in a fully protected forest. It likes to have streamside hunting for frogs, and will go for mammals, snakes. And he likes to be out in the sunshine because he's sunbathing. The sun, the feathers capture the vitamin D of the sun. And then when he pre-oils, alloprenes his wings, he will consume a little bit of that vitamin D that was caught on the oil and get his vitamin D. The barred owls are the ones that you hear most often outside your window in the summer evenings. Yeah, he has a very interesting history where he's been, he came from New Jersey, uh, you know, bonded on his rehabilitatory caregivers early on and you know couldn't be released back to the wild but he has this kind of aggressive streak. Anybody who's worked with him in all the f different places he's been over the years, he's gone from a few different facilities, he, the minute you walk in the door he's coming at you and there's this look in his eyes, uh, very fierce. For some reason I, I've escaped that wrath for whatever reason it is. And so now it's trying to get him to do things. If he does something, if he has to work to earn a reward, and the consequence is if you don't do what I'm asking you to do, you don't get the treat, uh, he feels self-worth. You know, you're not just sitting here, but you're actually engaging. Uh, but then they're so smart, you have to give them toys, otherwise they start tearing things apart. And he, you know, he's a little more of a challenge And that's Castor. He's, he's got a very droopy wing, very intelligent, very shy. Their feet are flat, so they're designed to walk on the ground. Unlike a, a hawk, eagle, or owl, which is designed to perch and grip a tree, the vulture's feet are very easy to whoop, run away. <laughs> you can see how a wild vulture is very shy around people. And when they seem so scared of us, they sort of lose our affection a little bit. You know, we recognize that they're individuals, but since they don't like us, they lose a little bit of our connection. Now vultures sort of, even when they're young, they start biting and pushing each other. And that's what they do at a carcass. They push each other out of the way. They're kind of slow eaters because they're very cautionary in case something might sneak up while they're on the ground vulnerable, eating, cleaning up carrion. So they're very beneficial to the environment by cleaning things up. And giving them that little sunroom to play in was a, a great change for them. They were so happy to be out there being able to bathe in the sun as you know, their species is wont to do. You know, when the light gets on him, you know, he's, he's really gorgeous. Uh, I and mean, they call him the turkey vulture because of resembling a turkey, but uh, he's brown, but the, the coloring is just really fabulous when the sun hits him. 
so gouge is different from a wild vulture and uh, an imprinted vulture like Ziggy. Uh, you know, he's completely thinks he, he's he's very friendly towards people. But when you have you know a thousand of these guys, or even a couple hundred, they the species kind of uh, overwhelms the individual. But then with the individual, you can kind of see his personality and how interesting he is. But again, this is why you don't uh, intercede with babies. You want to be very careful because if they imprint, it's irreversible. And you know, so it's always best to leave them there if you care. And if you're, you're really sure that the parents have disappeared, then you can uh, you know, call a rehabilitator to try to help. If you try to do it yourself, you can end up with an imprinted bird like this if you don't know what you're doing. And you know, he'll still stick his little hand in. Now if I hold my hand out like this, he can't land, but if I lower it down as a perch, he'll come to it. You can see how the, the feet are sort of soft. They don't grip uh, like a hawk would. Hey, hey, easy. Spread, spread. Spread. You, know, you do three repetitions and you click when you get the close approximation to what you're, you're doing or going for.